Hello, I'm Natalie Dupree. Today's menu starts with a classic preparation that is sure to impress your family and friends. A whole chicken turned into the case for a ground meat pate. It's delicious. In order to make this ballotine of chicken, I have to bone a whole three and a half pound chicken. And I think the reason I really wanted to do this on television was because of my friend Christy Sanford. She would, went all the way to London to the Cordon Bleu to study cooking. When she came home, she was in a terrible car accident. And as the car was turning over and over, she said, Dear God, please don't let me die before I bone a chicken. And it stood with me because, you know, a chicken's only a few dollars, and yet there's something so terrifying about doing something like this that it would be someone's last wish. She lived and happily ever after. But uh, it was her kind of last thought, and there was something terrifying about spending $3 to practice on something. So I want to do this and give you permission to practice. You'll find it a lot of fun to do it, and it becomes ultimately a very inexpensive dish. First thing you do is put the chicken the front side down. This is the front of the chicken. This is its chest. And I'm going to go down the backbone. So put that front side down. Actually, if you boned the wrong side, it wouldn't matter because you just sew it back up anyway. Um, and hold your knife right down to the bone. So go in here and keeping your knife right to the bone, go down. This is the little oyster. That's what I just cut out. Go down to this joint. There's a little joint right here, and you want to get your knife right in that joint, and then cut right on down here. You have no need for the parson's nose there, so you'll just cut it off. That's that little tail end of the chicken. And then go up here to the wing. I'm just going to cut the wing off. Some people actually leave the wing on, and I'll probably show you one there, and uh, stuff the rest of the chicken. Or if you want to bone the whole wing, you can. But wings are real hard to bone, and the way you kind of see where you're going is to look in where you see the fatty deposits and cut right through there. And that's the way you do that. So then go here and just, just hold your knife right to the bone. You can do this in about three minutes. If you don't have a lot of people watching you on television. And keep your, I'm just boning it like I would a chicken breast right now. Don't worry about all this excess meat that's on the bone. You can use this bone for stock. Or actually, you can scrape and get all that off and put it in your ballotine, ballotine later. Ballotine means uh, voting ballot. Uh, in other words, or, or ballot or package or something like that in French. Uh, doesn't sound like a very interesting culinary term. Now here we are at the um, ankle of the chicken. And I just go around the ankle uh, like I was making an anklet with my knife. And a little knife would probably do that a little better. I just got this nice, big, wonderful, sharp one. It's a boning knife, and it makes a big difference. And go in now to the thigh. And where you see the fatty deposits kind of clue you as to where the bone is, just like that wing bone that we snapped. Take your knife here. Slide right on down. Now you can, um, a sausage is usually a skin stuffed with ground meat. Uh, a hamburger is ground meat. What this is going to be is a, a chicken stuffed with ground meat. That's all the. It's all the same family. Take and snap right here and pull out that top one if you'd like. And then sometimes, if you've lived right, you can just take and twist this bottom one right off. Otherwise, go around here, right around the knee. It's a little uh, gushy feeling. And uh, lots of times it just works that I can just pull it right out. Go right around the knee here. That's the hardest place because of all the tendons, as you know, in people as well as chickens. That's where we have that mass of things. And then you can just shove, you see? It just pulls right off. So that's it. This chicken is now half boned. And that is pretty, a pretty easy thing to do. Now I'll go ahead and start the other side and see how much time I've got. Um, I think I've got enough time just to, I better show you the, the whole pull out the chicken bone, but you can see it didn't take me any time. Looks pretty odd there, but that's half the chicken. 
And when you see that, don't get hysterical and say, what am I going to do? Now, I'm going to walk over here and get one that is completely boned for you. Here's another one that's half boned, just so you can see the way that that would look. And I'll bring over this whole boned one. I'm going to cover those because I understand it's distressing for you all to look at that raw flesh there. So I've got this skin side down now. Now the first thing you need to do is, and I'm just going to pull out these extra little legs here. They've left on the legs just for me to show you how easy it is to pull them out. Isn't that great? First thing you need to do is to feel all over for bones after you've got it completely boned. Because the rudest thing to do is to choke your guests to death, you know. So you need to check for bones, cut out the bones, and there's a little one right there. It might work that you could would slice it out, but maybe not. Now all of these chicken parts, just you save those for chicken stock. Chicken stock is just boiled, you know, just boiled broth. And here's another bone there. We'll get rid of that one. And all those just pull right out. Now you've got this little leg there. Doesn't that look weird? When you see it, you think, oh dear, I have surely made a mistake. That's the funniest looking thing I've ever seen. But in fact, you haven't made a mistake. Now you can do one of two things. You can cut down this, the piece right here and spread the whole thing out like a cloth. Or you can tuck this in and kind of cut. Actually, some people leave the bones on and make the whole thing look like a chicken. But whenever I do that, it looks like a frog. I mean, it doesn't look like a chicken at all. So I have given up on that juncture. Some people can make it look just perfect. Maybe Jacques de Pen can. But to me, it looks like a crazy kind of a frog when I leave the wings and the legs on. So I've given up on that. Now, here we go. I'm going to go ahead now and cut and, and truss it up. Now, it's hard to find these trussing needles. I don't know why. It, it, they're just they just seem to uh, disappear from the cookware shops. But if you can, buy yourself a nice trussing needle. This one's got a little bend in it. It doesn't need to have. Um, and um, you can use any kind of thread. Some people use uh, the non-plastic kind of floss. floss. Now, all you're doing is sewing um, up this cut area. There must be a more delicate way to say the crotch of the chicken, but I can't think of it right this second. So you just call it what you will. Just go in here and cut up. And what you're doing is kind of making a shoelacing um, sewing pattern here. And the reason that you're doing it is because uh, this way is because you want to be able to pull the string out. So if you, if you sewed it up some other way that wouldn't pull out, um, then when you went to, to slice your chicken, you'd be in trouble. And I'm going to make the stuffing in just a second. I want to sew this base up here, and then I'll go back and I'll put the stuffing in. So there's like a full sheet of fabric now. All of a sudden, you have a square. So now let me tell you how to make the stuffing. Oh, I want to sprinkle this with salt and pepper before I get any further here. Let me get my hands clean. Oh, there they are. I have a wonderful team of people that help me. And what we've got now is plenty of clean rags. Now, shall I cover this? Just don't look at it if it bothers you, OK? Over here, I want to show you how to uh, chop, oops, right here I am, chop your shallot, your garlic, your parsley, and your thyme for your, um, for your chicken. I'll move that out of the way. How's that? OK, this is a little shallot. And um, a shallot tastes, to me, kind of like a cross between an onion and a garlic. Some people don't like me to say that, and they write me letters. But that's the way it tastes to me. But it is a member of its own family. And if you want to cut it in half before you peel it, it makes it a little easier, but that's nowhere near as easy as peeling um, a, an onion. In fact, the easiest way to peel a shallot is to have a great big quantity of, of um, boiling fat like they do in restaurants. But I don't have any at home, so I just have to struggle with it. Now, the way that you chop it is to cut it in half once it's peeled. Sometimes you have two little bulbs in the sh shallot, or shallot, some people call it. Cut into the root. I don't know if you can see that. And then you cut across and then down. And that's it. Pretty easy. Here's some thyme. And the way that I get this is just to pull it off the leaf here. Here's some parsley. The way that I would chop that is just to take my knife and walk my knife right over the parsley. Don't chop the stalk because it gets a bitty, gets some kind of sticks in your throat. And you just walk your knife over the parsley. See how easy it is? 
And they always said to chop it to dust at the Cordon Bleu. If you could tell what it was, it wasn't chopped finely enough. So that's the kind of thing they would do in their final exam. And here I have some marjoram, or you could use oregano, or if you don't have any other fresh herbs, just whatever you have around the house. The stuffing for this is really your own option. Now you need some salt pork or fat back or any or even bacon if you needed to. And I have cubed this here. You, d you need some fat to make a good pate. You need about a third of a ratio of fat, more or less. So then you just combine a half a pound of lean ground pork, a half a pound of chopped turkey breast, or it could be chopped chicken, or it could be veal, uh, and this a fourth to a half pound of cubed salt pork, and that's really totally up on you. It gives a lot of flavor to the mixture, but it gives a lot of fat, and people are concerned about that these days. Now you add to it an egg. I'm going to crack this separately and add that to it. And uh, that's just a little parsley that's mixed in there from my hand. So there's the egg and five chopped shallots and five chopped garlic cloves. You can see how good this is. Now this is not a classic French filling at all. This is just a, my own version of a great sausage. And two tablespoons of ground fennel seed, that's right there. Two heaping teaspoons of that parsley that I just chopped. Two heaping teaspoons of the thyme. And two heaping teaspoons of the marjoram. And then you have to season it heavily with salt and pepper. Because if it doesn't taste wonderful, you have gone to a great deal of trouble. And the next step is, is that I have to saute up a piece of this. And it's kind of like making your own Big Mac, you know. That's what this French chef at the La Varenne cooking school used to say, that he was making a petite Big Mac. And it's the cook's treat. Just take out a giant potion of this. This is more than enough, probably, to fill the chicken. But you need to make more than you need, obviously, uh, because you don't want to run short. So take out enough to make yourself a Big Mac and put it in a frying pan and fry it up. And then you'll have something nice like this. And take a taste of it. And if it doesn't taste good now and doesn't taste just a slight bit more salty than it should, it's not going to taste good later. So there you are. Get a good taste of that and then proceed with your mixture. I'm not going to try to taste that in front of you because with my luck, I'd start coughing frantically and we'd have to stop taping. So just pretend that this is that mixture. Now back to my chicken. I'm going to move it over here so you can see it better and move all this out of the way hopefully, so you won't see all the clutter and write me letters about being messy again. And spread this chicken, this mixture over the chicken. So you just spread it on in the inside. Now, you can, this probably is big enough to do a larger chicken if you wanted to. Um, you could do up to a five pound chicken probably with this mixture. It just depends on what you can get in your local grocery store. Have you noticed it's not consistent anymore? It just depends on, I think, on what's going on in the chicken industry price-wise. So there we are. Here's this. But you have to leave about an inch around it uh, so that you can fold it up right. Now, get yourself some shelled pistachios and press a fourth of the cup of the nuts into the stuffing in an interesting pattern. And here I have some dyed pistachios, but right next to the chicken here I have some undyed pistachios. And you can really choose whichever one you want. Sometimes I think these dyed ones are a little bit better. The worst part about doing this recipe is getting the pistachios out of the shell. That is the worst possible job for anyone. And I have yet to figure out a simple way to do it. Now, be careful that any large pieces, if you could put ham in here or you could put chunks of turkey or chunks of chicken, and you want it because it makes a pretty pattern. And actually, your ham should be just a little thicker than this. If you could, this is, um, uh, much, much thinner than it should be. We, we would really need to have a, a, a little thicker piece, maybe the size of your finger. But into every life, a little rain must fall. What I can do is put several pieces all together here to make it look a little bigger. But if these pieces butt against each other, just like if the pieces of pistachio butt against each other, I better fold it up now and roll it, then what happens is that when you cut it, it breaks apart. So take this and sew. Sew your chicken all the way up. Oop, I've got to stick that leg in. It just poked out there. And sew it up. Let's see if I can do this in a little easier manner. All the way up, going from the inside out. 
There we go. Just like I showed you before. And it won't take you but a minute. Now, you, in case you never guessed, I flunked home ec. I have lost the knot there, and it's going to maybe cut me a little short of my string. But just keep doing that under oven, over motion until you get a tight little package. I've got one here for you, so I'm going to stop this so you can't see what a bad seamstress I am and pull out the one that's already done, that's been cooked. And what I have here is some stock, which I would put that whole raw chicken into. Just stick it in there with three to four cups of chicken stock. Now, this stock we've used to cook the ones that I've got right here. So you bring it to a boil, you reduce the heat, and you cook it about an hour, hour one, an hour, an hour and a half, or about 25 minutes a pound. Or if you want to, you can put it about six hours in a crock pot on low. But check the temperature with a thermometer, and here's one that's done. See how it looks? Check the temperature with a thermometer. You always want it to be at 180 degrees to be sure. Now let it stand in the liquid until it's cold, but you can put that in the refrigerator to let it stand if you want to. A lot of people are afraid to do that, but in fact, you don't want to just leave this out at room temperature indefinitely. You remove the chicken, drain it, and then you put it into a bread or loaf pan. I'll just pull this out right here. There's this. Okay. Get these guys out of the way. And then you weigh it down with a brick or a board, and you refrigerate it overnight. Now, that pushes the whole thing together. Okay. The next day, you remove the weight, you take off any fat that might be there, and what's inside that pan is frequently natural aspic. Remove the string, and you slice it. And it slices very nicely if it's cold. Now look how easy that string comes out. Whoop, see? Isn't that great? <laughs> so there's the string. Huh? And then you just slice it as thinly as you possibly can, and it gives you a beautiful pattern. And you'll see this all sliced Mirac miraculously at the close of the show. So there we are, and isn't it pretty? Okay, now, uh, if you have a fennel frond, you can use it to garnish the dish, or any fresh herb, but there's fennel in it. To make the mustard cream sauce, all you do to, is whisk together three-fourths of a cup of sour cream and a fourth of a cup of Dijon mustard. It's very easy, and I'll show that to you in a minute. Now, the charred green beans. Tip and tail, two pounds of green beans. Heat five tablespoons of butter in a large frying pan. And when very hot, add the beans. You don't cook them first, see? And you brown them ever so slightly. This is my own idea. I love green beans that are slightly black and charred, but still a little crisp. It's just really wonderful. And you just continue cooking until the beans are very soft. Season it with salt and pepper. Here they are right here. And now I want you to see one of my favorite times in the whole world and learn about rice from a good friend of mine. They may still be planting rice by hand in many parts of the world, but here in the United States, rice is frequently planted by airplane. Below are rice fields ready for planting. Some of the fields have already been flooded. Rice is one grain that can grow in water, and that gives it an advantage because the water drowns out any competing weeds. Hi. I'm Joanne Lamb Hayes, food editor of Country Living Magazine and co-author of a cookbook on rice. For centuries, half the world has lived on a diet that's been based on rice. Uh, although rice came to America in the early 17th century, we tend to think about it as a side dish, but not anymore. I predict that the 90s will be the decade of rice, that athletes will be carving up on rice main dishes that will move from the side to the center of the plate. Uh, America grows almost all the rice that is eaten here. There are only a few kinds imported. They've discovered lots of wonderful techniques, uh, ways of irrigating areas where rice formerly wouldn't have been able to be grown, and they even sow the rice from the air. Several important things about cooking rice. First of all, it's most important to select a rice that's perfect for the kind of dish you want to make with it. I have several rices here. There are 40,000 varieties. These are just a few. Uh, what most Americans tend to cook is a long grain, white, American grown rice. Uh, this is an American grown, long grain, brown rice. This is converted rice, which has been steamed so that the nutrients from the bran layer go into the rice. 
Um, this is basmati rice, which was formerly imported, but now it's grown in Texas. Wild rice, which is not really rice, it's a Native American grain. Uh, this is jasmine, which used to be imported, and now they've discovered to, how to uh, grow it in Texas as well. This is a mixture of California short grain rices. Uh, and this is arborio, which is uh, an Italian rice used for risotto, makes a nice creamy sauce. And this is a short grain brown um, American rice. Uh, the most important thing to do is to measure your ingredients. You can't just put a big pot of water with the rice in it. Um, follow the directions on the package. If they're not there, they're all in the book. For nearly a century, Le Creuset's colorful French cookware has been a favorite in kitchens around the world. From its bold finishes and uncompromised quality to its easy to clean materials, the brand's range of iconic products are as easy to use as they are to love. Sometimes the simplest things are, seem to be the most difficult for people. I just wanted to show you how to make a simple rice. Just put two cups of water and a cup of long grain white rice, a half a teaspoon of salt, and add some black or white pepper. Some people prefer white pepper. And I like, kind of like the black spots in there. And a tablespoon of butter. Bring it to the boil, stirring it once or twice. Lower the heat to a simmer and cover it with a tight lid. Cook it 15 minutes. If the rice isn't tender or if the liquid is not absorbed, then you cook it three to four minutes longer and season again with some more salt and pepper. Uh, if you want to know that it's done, you take a little piece of the rice and put your finger into it and tear it apart. And if you can see just a little tiny white dot in the center, then you know it's done. I won't try to show that to you. And fluff it always with a fork. If the rice is made ahead, it can be easily reheated in a colander over boiling water or in the microwave. You cover the rice with a lid or wax paper to keep it from drying when you're doing it on top of the stove. Now, the mustard cream sauce for our chicken. And by the way, a tomato sauce is really terrific with this chicken as well, or a luscious brown sauce. You can serve that chicken hot or cold. Uh, and it freezes marvelously once it's cooked. So to make the mustard cream sauce, you just whisk together three-fourths a cup of sour cream and a fourth a cup of Dijon mustard. The first chicken that you make will take you two hours because you're terrified. The next chicken, here's your sauce, the next chicken will take you, oh, let's see, about half an hour. The third chicken will take you 15 minutes, and from then on in, it's five minutes. What I always say is to do seven chickens all at once, throw them in the freezer, and one time fill them with meatloaf, and one time fill them with sausage, and one time make a fancy stuffing, and one time fill them with spinach, cheese. You can fill it with anything. Serve them hot or cold. Those are going to be an appetizer. Now, the grilled honey ginger fish steaks. They are fabulous. What I have here is some chopped ginger and chopped green onions. And I have over here, excuse me, ginger and green onions to chop. Here I have two tablespoons of chopped ginger and four tablespoons of chopped green onions. And I'm going to mix them with two tablespoons of peanut oil and two tablespoons of honey. So just throw all this together. That's your marinade. Now, I have several different kinds of fish that this can be done with, and they're all terrific. I have tuna, I have swordfish, and I have amberjack here. The way you cook a fish under the broiler or on the grill is to measure it for its thickness, and you look how thick it is, and then you say you cook it 10 minutes total to the inch of thickness, or even 8 if you're grilling it. Uh, according to the uh, total of like five minutes on each side if you're doing it on the grill. You marinate it there covered with plastic wrap. Well, you know me, I always throw everything in a plastic bag. And yes, sometimes I wash them and reuse them. I don't reuse them after I cook fish in them, though. And um, then put your fish on your broiler pan. Marinate about six hours. You oil your grill or your broiler pan, throw them under the broiler, cooking them, as I said, uh, five to seven minutes. Wrong oven again. And here they are. Roll them about five to seven inches from the um, heat of the broiler pan. 
and they're done. And they're just delicious. Meanwhile, you take that marinade and you throw it in a pan and bring it to a boil. And when it's nice, you're just trying to make sure that it's really cooked. And then you pour it over your fish. And of course, I would have that in a dish. And it's terrific. You're going to love it. It's easy, too. It's a good last minute thing. And if you're doing the Valentino chicken, you can do that ahead and it's frozen. So then you can do this at the last minute. The grape tart is also a fix ahead. Preheat your oven to 400 degrees. And I've already sprinkled a half a cup of sugar over three cups of grapes, and I've let it stand, you know, half an hour or so. And in a food processor or with an electric mixer, this is easy with an electric mixer, beat two egg yolks and a half a cup of sugar, and then you add uh, one whole egg. And then you gradually add um, some butter, about half a cup of butter and a cup of flour, that's plain flour and some rum flavoring, if you'd like, and some almond extract, about a fourth of a teaspoon of that, a little bit more of the rum flavoring, about two teaspoons of that, and a cup of milk. And you just whip that all together in your food processor so you get a nice batter. And while that's doing, I'll spray this. You really heavily butter it or spray it as I did. Pour in part of your batter. It's a really wet batter. Then you spoon in the grapes and their juice, and your sugar would be a little bit more mixed in. Of course, you would spoon it in. I know you would do it in a neat way. And then you pour in the rest of the batter, and you bake it in the lower rack of the oven at 400 degrees for 40 minutes or so, or until a toothpick comes out clean. Now I know what oven I'm in. Right oven. And here it is. Stick your toothpick in to be sure it's clean. It's really lovely. It's soft and custardy. You can serve it from the pan, but since you might want to dress this up, we'll show you how. The starter for today's menu is a marvelous Valentine with mustard cream sauce. The main course is honey ginger fish steak with this little hint of the Orient, accompanied by charred green beans and boiled rice. For dessert, there's another classic dish, Dave's Grape Pudding Tart. Don't be intimidated by the Valentine. It'll be fun.